want to welcome everyone and uh, apologize for uh, being late. We had a conference that uh, ran a little longer than, than normal, uh, discussing some things you may have been reading and hearing about lately. Uh, this is a hearing on the impact of Obamacare on job creators and their decision to offer insurance. The committee will come to order and, consistent with the policy of the Oversight Committee, I will read the mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent, and second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I will. Uh, now, recognize uh, myself. Give me just one second for an opening statement. I will uh, recognize the uh, gentleman from uh, Illinois for his opening statement while I am in the process of finding mine. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And before I begin, let me take the opportunity to acknowledge the presence of a dear friend of mine and certainly a friend to all of the people who have been in the House and in the Senate, a former distinguished member of this body who was also chairman of the Small Business Committee and a member of the United States Senate, uh, Senator Jim Tallent, is with us, and I am pleased to see you, Jim. I must confess that I had two bills that Jim and I co-sponsored <laughs> that were passed into law. And, and so he represents uh, some of the proudest moments of, of my tenure here, so I am delighted to see him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For several years, I have been a supporter of a national health plan. Good quality, affordable health care should not be a privilege afforded to just a few. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act provided a pathway to bring affordable health care for the masses. It balances the needs of businesses and workers with accessibility and affordability. Large and small businesses consistently express their concerns about a rise in health care costs. The Affordable Care Act addresses this concern with cost containment measures for the employer, such as small business tax credits, insurance market reforms, rate reviews, price transparency, and the creation of health marketplace exchanges, just to name a few. The anticipated reductions on health premiums enable job creators to hire more workers, increase salaries to maintain their workforces, and to reinvest in new technologies for their business growth. The Center for American Progress estimates that health care reform that reduces premium growth will add 250,000 to 400,000 jobs annually over the next decade. The Affordable Care Act also addresses the needs of workers. The Act eliminates job lock, which discourages workers from seeking new opportunities for fear of losing health coverage. The ACA supports the entrepreneurial spirit of the American workforce, as nearly 10 million self-employed Americans have the ability to purchase insurance for their families. Additionally, the Act makes health insurance affordable with premium assistance for eligible employees. Lastly, a re recent Harvard study estimated that one American family filed for bankruptcy every 90 seconds in the aftermath of an illness. Three quarters of them had health insurance at the time of the precipitating health event. In addition, medical debt burdens families with the inability to pay for other expenses, contributes to credit card debt, and causes people to delay necessary medical care. The Affordable Care Act ensures that these nightmare scenarios will no longer be common. In my district, there are many Medicare and Medicaid recipients 
that have established community health centers as their medical home. Medicaid beneficiaries that rely on health centers for user care were 19 percent less likely to use the emergency room at a hospital than other providers for non-emergency and usual care services. Overall, health centers saved the health care system between $9.9 billion and $17.6 billion annually. Community health centers provide high-quality health care regardless of the ability to pay, and health centers in Illinois have a tremendous impact on our economy and employment. In 2008, 40 health centers operated over 350 sites, contributed almost $1 billion to the Illinois economy, and directly employed almost 6,000 Illinoisans. Indeed, for every 10 people employed by an Illinois health center, an additional four jobs were created in their surrounding communities. Illinois health centers served over 1.1 million patients, nearly 80 percent of whom had no health insurance. Helping them cope with chronic health conditions and general health issues to be able to work and care for their families. Repeal of the health care law would eliminate $11 billion in support for our community health centers over the next five years, funding that will nearly double the number of patients served today and greatly strengthens Illinois' economy. I know a little bit about health care, given the fact that my congressional district has more than 20 hospitals, 21 to be exact, four medical schools, a large number of community health centers and other outlets. And I can tell you that health care is the lifeblood of our community. Simply put, the Affordable Health Care Act is indeed progress. I thank you for this hearing and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, first, I want to thank our distinguished witnesses uh, for your patience and for your willingness to uh, lend us your insight and your perspective on what all of us agree is a very important issue. As we sit here this morning, uh, Washington is debating the relative merits and demerits of deals or plans or solutions, whatever euphemism you want to use, averting the short-term debt crisis. Uh, however, our country continues to face long-term fiscal crises, uh, some of which is rooted in the calls that we need substantive reform and return to our founding principles. Quite simply, government is too big. Out of control spending and overregulation have threatened America's credit rating and crippled businesses' ability to create jobs. When asked what the single greatest impediment to job growth is in the United States today, and I hasten to add, I come from a state with about 10 percent unemployment and some counties are as much as 20 percent. But when asked what the greatest impediment to job growth is in the United States, the founder of Home Depot simply responded, the U.S. government. That is a stinging indictment. Our dire economic situation requires us to take a hard look at every dollar we spend and fundamentally reform programs headed down the wrong path to fiscal insolvency. At the same time, we must be enacting pro-growth policies paving the way for American companies to grow and expand, creating the jobs that will spark a broader economic resurgence, which brings us to why we are here today. The current health care law was marketed to the American people as a means to provide high-quality, low-cost health coverage options to every citizen in the country, while ensuring that those who like their current coverage can keep it. However, time and time again, we have discovered examples exposing this political myth the uncertainty surrounding the law's broader implementation and the expectation of future taxes have worsened an already dreary economic picture. While we often hear about the looming debt crisis, we are also in the midst of a job crisis, one that Obamacare has done nothing to ameliorate and in many instances has served to exacerbate. From new taxes to increased government mandates and regulations to picking winners and losers based on arbitrary criteria. The new legislation burdens businesses with confusion and uncertainty, the exact wrong prescription for turning around our floundering economy. Further, as the full impact of certain sections become more clear, we are uncovering myriad disincentives and hidden taxes embedded within the law that serve to negatively impact businesses' bottom line. 
while CBO estimates the law will reduce the number of jobs by 80,000 by the end of the decade. And finally, instead of allowing employees to keep the coverage they currently have, tax subsidies in Obamacare will cause many employers to drop workplace health insurance, health coverage, forcing work workers to purchase their own insurance, all the while skyrocketing costs and further deepening our Nation's budget deficit. In a recent survey, McKinsey & Company found that 30 percent of employers will definitely or probably drop health insurance in 2014 a scenario not contemplated when the initial costs were calculated in a rushed, predominantly hidden legislative process. Thus, the Federal Government will yet again pick up the tab, an outcome that is simply unacceptable and untenable given the current fiscal climate. So we are here today to examine the true impact of Obamacare on you, Americans' job creators, and whether employees across the country will be dropped from their current coverage based on Obamacare's arcane requirements. And with that, on behalf of all of us, uh, other members will have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will introduce our distinguished panel from my left to right, your right to left. Andrew Putzer is the CEO of CKE Restaurants, which I have a parenthetical that says Hardee's and Carl's Jr. My history could very well be wrong. I think Hardee's may have its origin in the upstate of South Carolina and specifically perhaps in Spartanburg with Mr. Richardson and Mr. Bradshaw. But if I am wrong on that, as I frequently am. Sir? Okay, good. Well, I, as usual, I am close but wrong. <laughs> I hope my wife is listening. Grady Payne is the president of Connor Industries. Uh, welcome. Uh, Mr. Will Morey is the president and CEO of Morey's Peers. Welcome. Victoria Braden is the president and CEO of Braden Benefit Strategies, Inc. Uh, welcome. Mr. Brewer is the president of Lockton Benefit Group. Welcome, Mr. Brewer. Mr. Terry Gardner is the vice president of Small Business Majority. Welcome. Uh, consistent with uh, committee rules, all witnesses must be sworn before they testify, so I would ask you to please rise and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? May the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. There are, should be a series of lights which mean what they traditionally mean in our culture. Green means go, yellow means speed up. Uh, and try to get under the light, and red means stop. <laughs> I'd love to come to Chicago. Uh, we will now recognize you for five minutes. The yellow light or amber light means you have about a minute left, and the red light uh, means you stop. So we will begin with Mr. Putzer and go from left to right. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on the impact of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act on job creation. As the Chairman noted, my name is Andrew F. Puzder. I am CEO of CKE Restaurants. With me today are Cheryl Soper, our Vice President of Benefits, in case you have any really difficult questions for me, Louis Farias, who is our Vice President of Government Relations, and also my sons, Matt and John. Uh, we, CKE owns and franchises 3,182 restaurants in 42 states and 23 foreign countries under the Carl's Jr. and Hardee's brand names. With our franchisees in the United States, we employ about 70,000 people. Our company is a job creation machine. We create jobs by building new restaurants. Each restaurant employs about 25 people, and we invest over a million dollars in the community where we construct the restaurant. But our job creation goes way beyond our building of restaurants. Last year, we spent over one and a quarter billion dollars for job creating capital projects, media and advertising, supplier products and services. For example, we spent a billion dollars on food and paper products, which gives jobs to everybody from the farmer who plants the seeds or tends the herds, to the people that process and manufacture our products, to the guy who drives the truck and delivers it to the back door. We spent $175 million on media advertising, employing people in television stations, radio stations and newspapers. We spent $30 million on repairs and maintenance, employing people that wash the windows, cut the lawn, fix the air conditioner, and slurry the blacktop. Our franchisees own 70 percent of the restaurants, so they spent, you would assume, about $70 million in addition to that 30. We spent $60 million on capital expenditures, building restaurants, remodeling restaurants, 
and investing in our infrastructure. The people we employ in these concentric circles that really grow out from our restaurants went to grocery stores, went to the movies, sent their kids to school, bought cars, bought houses, just creating jobs on a very broad basis, which is the way the free enterprise system works. And you can see other businesses with concentric circles growing out from them that overlap and really drive the greatest economy the world has ever known. I am very concerned that in the coming years we will be unable to create as many jobs as we would like due to the increased expenses necessitated by laws such as the PPACA. I will start with the law's menu labeling provision. That requires disclosure of the caloric content of our products on our menu boards. Now, as a company, we support nutritional disclosure. We have and have for years had comprehensive, effective, and economical nutritional disclosure in our restaurants and broadly available online at our website. We estimate that should we have to replace the menu boards in all of our restaurants, the cost would be approximately $1.5 million. That is 17 percent of the $8.8 .8 million we invested last year on job creating new restaurant construction. Independent research done to date demonstrates that caloric menu labeling has no impact on consumers' eating habits. In other words, this was a politically correct solution that is ineffective and imposes unnecessary costs on American businesses that could better spend their money and their time creating jobs and economic prosperity. Nutrition disclosure can be accomplished effectively comprehensively and economically. The current law simply fails in all three of these respects. Now, on to the ACA's mandatory medical coverage provisions. I am not an expert on health care law other than how it impacts our company. I also know that there are people who believe universal health care coverage is beneficial, and I am not here to debate that. However, there is a sacrifice that must be made to gain that benefit. The question is whether the costs are worth the benefits. The ACA will eliminate job creation and opportunity. Our best estimate? The ACA will increase our health care costs approximately $18 million per year should it be implemented as we currently understand the regulations. That is a 150 percent increase from the $12 million we spent on health care last year and approximately double the $8.8 .8 million we spent on job creating new restaurants. At this point, we do not intend to drop coverage for our employees. But the money to comply with the ACA must come from somewhere. We use our revenue to pay our bills and expenses, to pay down our debt, and we reinvest what is left in our business. That is how we create jobs. There is no corporate pot of gold we can go to to cover increased health care costs. New unit construction will cease if we have to allocate the monies for that construction to the ACA, and building new restaurants is how we create jobs. We would also have to reduce our other capital spending, and capital spending not only creates jobs, but is important to maintaining and growing our business. We would need to reduce the number of our full-time employees and increase the number of our part-time employees. We would need to automate positions where we could and reduce compensations for the positions that we retain. As I speak with franchisees and encourage them to build new restaurants, I am constantly met with concern about their economic futures. They are concerned about poorly conceived government regulations such as the ACA's menu labeling provision. They are concerned about the ACA's mandatory health care coverage provisions stifling growth and possibly requiring that they close restaurants that are marginally profitable now, but which would be unprofitable once the ACA comes into effect. The result is stagnation. The simple fact is that regulations such as those growing out of the ACA do impose costs and those costs do result in reduced growth, stifling both job creation and prosperity. Prosperity is neither Republican nor Democrat. It is neither liberal nor conservative. It is a bipartisan issue. People are unsure about their futures. American people are suffering because they don't have jobs. American businesses want to create jobs. And we respectfully request that Congress review the ACA to determine which provisions can be administered in a way that reduces costs for the businesses they impact. We would further request that Congress review the ACA's provisions to determine which provisions, on balance, are detrimental to our Nation's economic prosperity and eliminate such provisions. If done effectively, this review would encourage job creation and prosperity, as well as better government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poster. Mr. Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify. I am Grady Payne, CEO of Connor Industries with our headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas. 
We have plants in Texas, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, and Virginia. We supply cut lumber and assembled wood products to manufacturing companies for their shipping and crating needs, as well as logistics and supply chain management services. Our company was started in 1981 with five people. Today we are celebrating our 30th anniversary with 450 employees and 11 plants. Over 120 of our people today have been with us over five years and 22 of those over 15. Ours is a commodity business which works off low margins. In each of our markets, we compete against companies that have fewer than 50 employees as well as importing crating companies that we compete against. These companies will not be subject to the penalties imposed under the new law. It will give them an unfair cost advantage over our locations. According to the SBA, we are a small business, but not so by the Affordable Care Act. We are caught in the no man's land between assistance and exemptions for smalls and waivers for large corporations and other powerful entities. We started our medical plan in the 90s and offered coverage to all employees. Most of our production line employees opted out due to cost. To meet Federal discrimination laws, we were forced to create groups of employees and significantly reduce the number of whom to whom insurance was offered. This remains today. We offer coverage to approximately 140 employees and struggle each year to get 75 percent participation. The company pays approximately 55 percent of the total premium cost. Ours is a fully insured plan. The new discrimination rules created by the law have the effect of pushing us immediately into a self-insured alternative or face a fine of up to half a million dollars. The IRS has just delayed enforcement of the new non-discrimination testing until regulation can be written. However, our plan could be tested and penalized as early as next year. Without changes in these harsh penalties, we may be forced to drop our plan completely prior to the, the State-based exchanges even becoming available. In 2004, we, we were faced with even more difficult choice. Option one is to expand coverage to all our employees and pay the full premium cost. To do this, the additional cost would be approximately $1.5 million over the $750,000 we spend today on premiums. Option two is expand coverage to all our employees and have employee contributed costs set at affordable amounts based on the law's affordability rates in each employee's household income. If all employees stayed into the plan, our additional cost under this uh, option would be estimated at over a million dollars. Option three is to discontinue all policies and pay a non-tax deductible penalty of $2,000 for each employee for our 450 employees plus some portion of a penalty for employee turnover during the year. The cost of this penalty option is well over a million dollars and it is not tax deductible. The impact of this law will cost our company a million dollars or more no matter which option we take. And worse, some of the extra cost, if not all of it, may be classified as a penalty and not tax deductible. We would owe income tax plus the penalty. Today, these estimates, estimates total more than the company makes. We have been very blessed to be a profitable company even in these hard times. We have had to make many sacrifices in pay, bonus programs, and people. We have no tax loopholes. We are a taxpaying company. We are a company caught in the middle. As the law stands now, our 30-year business is at risk of being legislated out of business. How can this be? Our lives are in this company. We have done a good job for our customers, our employees, and all our families. We understand the goal of getting everyone medical coverage, and we agree that it is a worthy goal, but the massive cost hits us right between the eyes. We are too small to get favorable group rates or self-insurance contracts and too large by statute to be exempt, even though our profit centers are less than 50 employees in each location. There has to be a more equitable way to achieve this goal than to cripple a small business like ours. The ratio of cost to earnings is, is overwhelming for a company our size. We have seen bad markets before, though none as bad as this one. Our current capital expansion and business development plans are and will be stopped by this law because expansion and hiring requires cash. The impact of the law robs us of our needed growth capital. Our goals turn from hire and grow to cut and survive. I thank all of you for your service to our great nation and for allowing me to plead the case of Connor Industries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Morey. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Good morning, uh, Chairman Gowdy and Ranking Member Davis. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on this important matter. Uh, my name is Will Morey. I am President of Morey's Peers. Morey's Peers is a family business that began in 1969. It began with very humble beginnings, uh, a single giant slide on a postage stamp piece of property along the boardwalk uh, along the sea in Wildwood, New Jersey. It now consists of three piers, two water parks, 
and 120 rides or attractions. Our operating season is primarily from Memorial to Labor Day. However, we operate shoulder seasons weekends starting Easter and uh, concluding on Halloween. We have 110 year-round benefited staff members, and we grow, an addition, we grow to an additional 1,500 seasonal staff members during that time. I am privileged also to be the vice chair of our International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, which represents 3,000 fixed site supplier and individual members in the United States. I will be chairman of that organization in 2013. Uh, by way of perspective on the industry, our total domestic economic impact is approximately $53 billion. We employ 700,000, of which 600,000 are seasonal employees, typically young people in their first jobs, retirees, school teachers, and others supplementing their incomes during the summer months. Now, there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty related to this bill from my perspective, but there is one thing that I know at Maurice Pierce we can be certain about and that is the inclusion of seasonal workers in the definition of full-time employee and the lack of suitable recognition of seasonal employees within our industry will cause severe negative consequences to our business. Now, I am here to be constructive, and I would really like to be a part of the, the solution, but the fact is, as it stands, the law will have a substantial negative impact to our industry, on our seasonal employees, and our permanent employees as well. From our point of view, the law is large, it's a large expense, it is an administrative nightmare. It is hard to see any appreciable benefit to anyone working at Maurice Pierce, but it is easy to see the negative impact on our ability to provide jobs and run our business productively. Now, it is important to note that our industry seasonal workers are hired, for, are hired for short, temporary periods. They have a very different set of expectations and responsibilities than full-time employees, and they were clearly an element of the workforce that Congress did not pay close attention to when drafting the bill. The law will force businesses like Maurice Pierce to provide health insurance to seasonal workers. And as a result, we have the following concerns. Immediate loss of jobs, including full-time positions due to decreased profitability. Negative economic impact on the communities surrounding attractions such as ours as operating schedules are adjusted and employment is curtailed. And the promotion of a seasonal labor society that schedules employees under 30 hours per week or terminates employment before 90 days. This will happen across the entire country, hurting both seasonal businesses and seasonal employees. And very importantly, and close to my heart, is uh, the ability to be able to reinvest. Capital is an incredibly important part of the attraction industry, and reinvesting in our businesses is critical to creating growth and future jobs. Additionally, the administrative and compliance issues are, simply put, extreme. The majority of these workers are employed five months or less. By the time the 90-day administrative period passes, they will have insurance for less, th for less than two months at most. Many of these seasonal workers get their health care from other sources parents, university, their primary full-time positions, and will opt out of our coverage. Yet we still have to do the following. Ensure compliance, track work days, track average hours per week, offer the insurance, educate and present the insurance program, auto-enroll into the insurance program, get declinations to the program, and maintain records for all of the above. Consider a workforce that swells from 110 to 1,600 employees, with individuals starting and ending their employment every day of the week throughout the season. Just imagine tracking and managing this information. This is unreasonably burdensome and will provide little to no benefit to the seasonal employees. Now, the bottom line is the inclusion of seasonal workers in the definition of full-time employee will needlessly cause severe negative consequences to businesses like Maurice Piers, to seasonal and full-time employees, and to their communities. Ultimately, if this law is to go into effect, it should be amended to properly recognize the real world of seasonal employees and their tremendous importance to our industry and to our national economy. I would like to conclude just by mentioning that you know, we really want to be a great business. Uh, we want to grow. We want to support our community. We want to bring as many, we want to create as many career opportunities as we can. That is what life in America is about. So please don't burden us with, uh, with, with, uh, with the needless um, compliance and other issues that come along with this bill. Thank you for your attention and consideration of this important matter. Thank you, Mr. Morey. Uh, Ms. Braden. Thank you. Um, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, thank you for inviting me here today and to testify. My name is Victoria Braden. I am President and CEO of Braden Benefit Strategies. We are truly a small business. My business at this point has three full-time employees and two interns. Um, 
and we deal with small businesses. That is our client base. We deal with companies that have 20 to 300 employees. In, 19, or in 2002, I started Braden Benefit Strategies with one employee in the basement of my home. Our business model was to, <clears throat> to be a resource for small businesses headquartered in Georgia, advising them on employee benefits, specifically group health insurance. My business plan was expanded, was to expand our small group market and base and then to grow a large individual market practice. In 2008, I moved the company into a building, took the risk, rented a space based on my long-term plan. At the end of our move, I, had employ I was employing full -time, three full-time people, one part-time person, one intern, and myself. In addition, we sold our backroom services to three other health insurance agents, which kept them, their business viable. I had visions and a business plan to grow to 8 to 10 full-time employees. However, in, in December 2009, we looked at that and it was time to add our individual health product, which is what we had um, looked at for our expansion, put in a call center, hired a full-time person, and put an aggressive marketing campaign together. On March 24th, the day after PACA passed, I had looked at my business plan before, knowing that it could be coming, and I made sweeping changes to my business. I eliminated our expansion to the individual health market, which I still to this day believe was a good decision since the um, individual market will most likely go to the exchange. I terminated that full-time person. I lost revenue from the sales we already had, which was accounted for $35,000 annually. And to these other gentlemen, that's, a, that's just a small amount. To me, it's a, it's a person. It's huge. Um, I also terminated a part-time claims administrator, and then I terminated my part-time accountant and outsourced that. It, the law eliminated my plans to grow and now have turned me into what could possibly be no business at all in 2014. Um, on top of that, we advise small businesses on their health insurance options, and that has become very expensive. My company has had to go out and educate ourselves on the health insurance when we get bad information or conflicting information because the bill is so intensive. We have to hire a lawyer, have to ask the lawyers for the differences. And oftentimes we go between three law firms, again, trying to, get the, trying to figure out what it is that the law exactly says and how to advise our, our clients. It will take a, it has also taken a huge financial toll on my business from the value of my business. With my business in 2007, I was looking at a, a value of $1.2 million, two times my annual revenue, and now I am looking at a business worth zero. And the, the reason it is worth zero is because the declining, our declining business will then be worth nothing at the end when PACA goes into effect. On January 1, 2014, and I think this is probably the basis of why I am here, we expect 22 of our 65 clients to immediately drop their group health insurance. The size of the clients that we service will have no cost to the employer to not have insurance. There will be no penalty and no fine. Of those companies, I expect 769 people to be added to the PACA or to the exchange rules. Through ta PACA, the taxpayer is now subsidizing the cost, when that happens, of small business employees' health insurance. Our conservative estimate of 462 will be the first year, and other businesses will leave shortly after that. <clears throat> we always said the young and the healthy would take this bill and make it worthwhile. It will not, because the young and the healthy will find a way around the bill. We are already seeing that through the self-funded small business pieces that are being developed. Um, I would just ask you to reconsider not only the job loss of the bill, but the cost of the bill, both to employers and to the unexpected consequences of what is going to cost the United States Government. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Braden. Mr. Brewer. Chairman Gowdy. Sorry. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis. My name is Mike Brewer. I am President of Lockton Benefit Group of Lockton Companies, LLC, in Kansas City. On behalf of Lockton and our clients, I thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. Lockton is the largest privately held insurance brokerage and consulting firm in the world. Most of our 2,500 employee benefits clients are middle market clients, those with 500 to 2,000 employees. 
Our professionals are experts on last year's health reform laws provisions affecting employer group health plans. They have been instrumental in educating our clients regarding the law and analyzing its impact on our clients' employee benefits programs and their budgets. <clears throat> in May of this year, we also conducted a survey of our clients, soliciting their views on the costs and other implications of the reform law. We do believe that we are uniquely positioned to articulate the law's effect on employer-based health insurance plans. Mr. Chairman, the employer community is the single largest employer of health insurance in America. The majority of our clients want to continue to supply health insurance, but they struggle with the cost and the federally imposed complexity of plan administration. Health care reform adds to, rather than mitigates, the cost and complexity of providing employer-sponsored health insurance. For example, the Federal Government requires 52 separate notices, disclosures, and reports to enrollees in health insurance programs. Nineteen of these, and that is just so far, were added by health reform. This frustrates our clients immensely. They question why, during a recession, when employers are struggling mightily just to stay afloat, much less supply this valuable fringe benefit, Congress would make the process more expensive, more onerous, and more complicated. They tell us the additional cost, complexity, and uncertainty wrought by the law affects their ability to hire additional workers or even retain current full-time employees. Clients find it difficult to plan strategically in light of the uncertainty the law brings to their world. One client in our survey summed up the view of many regarding this law, calling it a job killer. Nearly 20 percent of our survey respondents said they will consider terminating their group insurance plan in 2014, and they cite cost and complexity as the main reasons that they will consider doing this. In our survey, 63 percent of respondents said they were concerned or very concerned about the cost of the law's immediate benefit mandates. 71 percent said they were concerned or very concerned about the cost of implication of the pay or play mandate on employers, and 60 percent about the cost of automatic enrollment. Our actuarial modeling of over 250 middle market client, clients validates our clients' concerns. Taken together, the law's immediate benefit mandates, waiting period limits, and auto enrollment requirements on average add 6.3 percent to our clients' health insurance cost on top of current health insurance inflation, and it is more in certain industries. The employer pay or play mandate in 2014 poses additional problems for employers. Because of the sizable difference between what most employers pay to supply coverage for an employee and the penalty they would pay if they terminated coverage, the vast majority of our clients have a significant financial incentive to exit the group insurance market in 2014. On average, our clients outside the retail, restaurant, and hospitality industries would save 44 percent off their current health care budget by terminating their group plans, leading nearly 20 percent to tell us they would consider doing just that in 2014. About 80 percent of our clients indicate they don't expect to consider terminating coverage, but the reason they give is the perceived need to provide health insurance to attract and retain clients. We are concerned that the moment they see they don't have to offer competitive health insurance, that 80 percent number could drop significantly. This would result in huge increases in exchange participation and subsidy liability for taxpayers. 17 percent of our survey respondents said they would work to avoid play or pay penalties by substituting more part-time employees for full-time workers. 44 percent said they will reduce the employer subsidy toward employee coverage, and 43 percent said they will reduce the employer's subsidy towards dependent coverage. That does not bode well for working Americans. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. In assessing the impact of this legislation, I urge you to place yourselves not only in the shoes of those Americans who need and deserve access to affordable health care coverage, but also in the shoes of the employers who supply valued coverage to 160 million of us. As one of our survey respondents wrote, this plan doesn't fix the health care problems, but shifts the burden to employers to take care of the issue without any type of assistance in covering the increase in costs.
We look forward to answering your questions and working with you to address the issues raised by our employer clients. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. Mr. Gardner. Good morning, uh, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the number one problem facing small business, uh, the ever-rising health care costs. I am Terry Gardner, Vice President of um, Policy at Small Business Majority. Uh, small Business Majority is a national nonprofit small business advocacy organization founded and run by small business owners. I myself have spent most of my career, I uh, was kind of shocked to add it up and to think I started my first business 40 years ago uh, as a self-employed commercial fisherman in Alaska, where um, I grew up. Uh, went on to uh, create a seafood processing company um, that uh, grew in over 22 years. And um, when I retired, I had 1,000 employees uh, with over $100 million in sales uh, exporting to 22 uh, countries. Um, other members of our senior team at Small Business Majority have also entrepreneurs. Um, and as business owners, um, we are well aware that government policies can take either of two course, courses. They can uh, uh, help promote job creation and uh, help promote business. And at the same time, they can be uh, other laws and regulations, um, in our experience, it can definitely be a burden on business and discourage growth. So we are not unaware of those. Um, situations um, from our own personal experience. Um, but the problem uh, facing uh, small businesses, those 22 million self-employed out there, uh, one-third of who don't have in coverage, and the um, nearly 6 million small businesses with under 100 employees, they, they keep saying uh, um, that health care costs ever rising are their number one uh, problem. We, done a lot of polling, scientific polls across the country, national and in many, many states. Uh, between December uh, 2008 and August uh, 2009, um, 67 percent of respondents said uh, reform was urgently needed to fix the economy. Uh, an average of 86 percent of those companies who do not provide uh, coverage said they couldn't afford it. Uh, 72 percent of those offer offering health benefits said they were struggling to do so and cited the cost as the reason they were struggling. Um, so this simply, you know, uh, paints a status quo that is unacceptable for small business. Um, we have also done some economic research um, that was conducted uh, by uh, MIT economist Jonathan Gruber uh, to look at the scenarios. Um, our country uh, then and now does face alternatives. We could do nothing about our health care system or we could try to change it so it works better. So we looked at those alternatives. Uh, doing nothing is a job killer. Um, the Gruber's uh, projection showed that uh, over the next decade that small employers would pay $2.4 trillion in health care costs. There would be a loss of 178,000 jobs. Uh, there would be negative impacts for employees, too, $834 billion in reduced business wages and a reduction in profits. So doing nothing is not a great scenario. Um, so that moves us to where we are at now, where we have the Affordable um, Care Act um, as the law in the country that we are here today discussing. Um, projected by CBO that it would uh, have the benefit of reducing the Federal deficit by $200 uh, million over the next 10 years and $1 trillion over, over the following decade, which is a positive um, for all businesses and all citizens. Um, but um, the, the point for small businesses is to reduce their costs so that they can keep more money in their bank account, which is what they fuel, use as fuel to expand and create uh, jobs. 
And there's many provisions in the ACA that are going to help um, small businesses, many of which do not offer uh, health coverage now, and many self-employed simply can't afford it. So there's new mechanisms here uh, in the ACA, tax credits uh, for small employers. Um, there are health insurance exchanges that will be established in the 50 states. Uh, some states have already moved forward, Massachusetts, Utah. We have exchanges that have been in effect for 15 years in Connecticut and uh, provides a lot of insurance to small groups. So it, we know there are uh, problems. You have heard about some of them here today with the ACA. We are not here to say they are perfect, but we think focusing on these um, and fixing them would be a better course of action than going backwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. I uh, will recognize uh, myself for uh, five minutes of questions. I will direct this to the uh, first uh, three witnesses to my left. Uh, what should the Federal Government do or stop doing to enable you to create more jobs? I am turning my speaker on or my microphone on. The, um, the government now is doing a lot to create a high degree of uncertainty in the business community. We are uncertain about what tax rates are going to be. We are very uncertain about health care costs, and the, one, the only thing we are certain about is that they are going to go way up. Uh, we are uncertain what is going to happen with energy, with the EPA. We are uncertain about unionization with the NLRB. There is a lot of uncertainty out there. When businesses are going to invest and create jobs, they generally want to come up with a five-year business plan, which shows you get a return on your investment at about 20 percent a year, and at the end of five years, you have gotten a return on your initial investment. If you can't do a forecast because you don't know your costs, you don't know your expenses, and what you do know you don't like, you are not going to invest. And American businesses are stalled. I think that chart shows it up there. It, it's, people are not investing because they can't show uh, a profitable return of their investment. And if you, if you think your expenses are going to go way up and you have two choices on what to do with your money, retain it so you can cover your expenses or invest it to grow and create jobs, you are going to hold on to your cash. So we are not seeing the kind of investment we should be seeing. And if the government would just work to create some certainty, some positive certainty for the business community, I think you would see an explosion of job creation. So. Uh is it fair for some of us like to say that our tax regulatory and litigation structures create the uncertainty that stifle job creation? Is that a fair statement, uh, tax, litigation, regulation? I think that is a very fair statement. Mr. Payne, what employees, what categories of employees are most likely to be adversely impacted by the implementation of Obamacare? Well, in our company, the, it is going to impact all of us. It's, it spreads completely out through the organization. Um, we can't necessarily cut sections out. We are kind of a complete pie. So it, you know, if you cut uh, part of it down somewhere, you have to equally pull out the support structure that goes with it across, uh, across the, uh, the lines. And so it is it's going to impact every area that, that we are we're involved in. Uh, you know, I agree with everything that, that, that was just said. Uh, in our case, our plants that we put in are, is, are about a million dollar investments. Uh, we add uh, people less than 50. Generally, we pump about a million dollars in payroll into those plants on an annual basis. Uh, we, uh, we cannot add any more plants not knowing what the, the cost structures are going to be going forward. Um, Will we cut people? We are trying to cut people all now. So it, it has an impact on all of us. Mr. Borey, the uh, President famously said that if you like your health insurance, you will be able to keep it. Uh, with respect to your company, is that statement true? We'll get you to turn your mic on. Uh, back to the comment that was made later about uncertainty. That's, that's one of our great concerns. We would like to offer our, our private plan essentially to our staff members. They are very important to us. We want to see that, they're, um, you know, that they have a great plan and they are well taken care of in that area. But it is unclear to us whether or not that is going to be the case or not. And when we look at things like the burden of the seasonal issue that I have been speaking of and what that means to us in terms of cost and compliance, you know, that endangers our ability to be able to provide the coverage that we are providing now. 
Mr. Gardner, I'm going to, I've only got a little bit of time left, so if I can get just a yes-no response from you on whether or not you support some other initiatives that might uh, solve some of our health care woes, do you support uh, incentivizing health savings accounts? I'm not sure what you mean by incentivizing. Uh, uh, through our tax structure. Yeah. Flexible spending accounts. I think they work, too. Do you uh, support uh, creating the same tax treatment for employees who want to purchase health insurance as the employer has? You mean self-employed? No, I mean an employee. If they want to uh, purchase health insurance on their own, um, should they enjoy the same tax benefits as employers? Yeah, well, this particular problem for self-employed now, we have a one-year provision that needs to be extended that self-employed don't have the same tax I'm not talking provision. about self-employees. I'm talking about individual employees, individuals who want to purchase health insurance. Should they have the same favorable tra tax treatment as employers? Yes. Uh, medical malpractice reform, does your organization support that? Yes, and we did uh, during the uh, ACA, we are on record as uh, uh, supporting that. Uh, thank you. My time has expired, and I will recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Do you want me to go, Mr. Davis. I will recognize the gentleman from Illinois, uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank our witnesses. And I, I must say that I was seriously impacted by all of your businesses, your courage, your determination, the tenacity, the fact that you have been able to make conscious use of yourselves to build strong businesses and provide opportunities for other people to work. Mr. Gardner, can I ask you, have you ever had any employees who didn't earn enough money to pay for health insurance? Yes. Um, Mr. Brewer, have you ever had any employers who didn't yeah. earn enough money to pay for health insurance? Yes, sir. Ms. Braden, have you ever had any who didn't earn enough to pay for health insurance? No. No? No. Mr. Morey, have you ever hired anybody that didn't make enough money to pay for health insurance? You have. Mr. Payne, have you ever had any who didn't earn enough? Uh, I'm not sure that I know the answer to that because I don't know what what cost would be, but I have got people that have turned down insurance before because of cost. Uh, Mr. Pusby, have you ever hired anyone who didn't have enough money when they got through to pay for health insurance? Well, we have a number of part-time employees who may not have enough, but we do offer them a very low mini-med, uh, you know, affordable plan. I, but I, I really can't say that I have ever done any research on that, but we probably have part-time employees who couldn't afford the plan. Well, let me ask you this question. Can you think of anything in life more important than being healthy? Uh, no. Well, your family, belief in God. Right. That's a good point, especially belief in God. I happen to be a practicing Christian. And I notice at my church that everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, that, that sort of reminds me of <laughs> Frederick Douglass one time when they were talking about the abolition of slavery. And every time somebody would come up with a way to do it, there would be a reason why it couldn't get done. And he ended up saying that there are those who reminded him of people who might have wanted the rain but without the thunder and the lightning, or they wanted the crops without plowing up the ground. Or they may have even wanted the ocean without the roar of the mighty waters. And so it seems to me that there are things that we want to happen, but somehow or another we can't bring ourselves to the point of doing what's necessary. Do we believe in tax credits? Let me ask, have any of you ever used tax credits in any facet of your businesses? I am sure that whenever they are available, we use them. <laughs> and, and so if tax credits are made available for small businesses to help provide health insurance 
for employees, that might be one way of helping some of those individuals who had no other way of You're being insured. Yeah, I think it would, uh, Congressman. But we, I, I will tell you that we offer all of our employees health care coverage and inexpensively. And I, I think of our 17,000 part-time employees, about 6 percent choose to take the health care coverage over the cash. You know, so it's you know, 94 percent would rather have the job and the compensation. Oh, I, I would certainly agree. And I guess when you say small business, it would be kind of difficult for one to suggest that your company was a small business, I mean, by pretty much any standard. That yeah, but one Congressman, the, the, we deal primarily with larger employers, but, but I fundamentally believe that the same advantages that are available uh, for our larger employers ought to be available to smaller employers as well. Well, let me ask you, do you believe well, that health care should be a right and not a privilege? Uh, that's a, that's a difficult question. You know, we we've created a system where people don't have to buy health care to get health care. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd certainly like to believe that it is a right. I think there are fundamentally some better ways that we could go about some of this. And I will tell you that our firm has been historically pro on health reform. Uh, it, 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 it's it's exactly what you said. It's just the form that that takes. Well, see, I think at the base of the discussion is what we believe in terms of individuals who live in our society. Ms. Braden, you were about I was. I am the person that actually deals with the small, small businesses I think that you were referring to. And on the tax credit that we have on the floor right now, the $25,000 or $25,000 of income and you could do this, I don't have but a handful of employers out of my, out of my group that can actually take advantage of that. And those employers are all nonprofits, so they are taking advantage of it against their uh, FICA taxes. So that piece of it I don't see. As far as health insurance being a fundamental right, so is being healthy, and people have a responsibility to that. And we are not seeing that in any, of our, in, in any of our small groups. We are not seeing folks going out and actually working to be healthy, which would then bring down the health insurance costs. Well, I think we could debate that a great deal, but my time is up. <laughs> now you are back. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. We now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, panel, for appearing here today. Uh, there, there are so many questions and so many directions I would like to go uh, today after hearing your testimony, and I don't think I have ever sat through a hearing where the testimony was almost so self-explanatory that a lot of the questions I had to ask have already been answered to some extent. Uh, Mr. Payne, you had laid out three options for your company in terms of health care. And uh, when we discuss Obamacare now, sometimes we get chastised for using that term, Obamacare. Uh, it uh, is known as the Affordable Health Care Act. After laying out your three options, uh, do you agree that it's affordable? Uh, it's, it's not affordable to us. Uh, the way it's structured, and talking about the credits for small business, we consider ourselves a small business. And, you know, some of the exemptions for less than 50 employees really hurt us. Uh, we don't get those exemptions, yet we are competing against the people that do. So, you know, it ought to be more of a level playing field. But I, to answer your question, is no, it's not affordable. Uh, is the current system uh, good? I, I won't say that the current system is good, but we are surviving and making a profit and growing and hiring people with the current system, dealing with year-to-year uh, -year, uh, increases in the, in the programs, dealing with through the insurance companies. Under the new program, uh, we may, uh, it could be that we may not have a business to, to grow. Uh, so it it's definitely changed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gardner, uh, today the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Actuary stated health care costs will double by 2020. Uh, considering President Obama passed Obamacare to reduce health care costs now, uh, will your business be able to cope with these increased health care costs? Well, um, fortunately for me, um, I have reached that retirement age and don't own a business today. But you represent but, several. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think that um, you know, there is more that needs to be done about cost containment. Um, I think that was uh, very evident 
uh, during the whole debate of the Affordable Care Act. More needs to be done. And uh, we have faced these kind of racing costs. If you look at a graph, as I did when I retired and got into health care, these costs have been going up like a rocket for decades. Okay, but yeah, we, we as a Congress, I wasn't here at the time, but we, we then passed massive sweeping health care reform that we didn't ask for, we don't want, and apparently we certainly can't afford. So you know, here we are moving forward with uh, what did then Speaker Pelosi say we need to pass this bill so we can find out what's in it. From what I'm hearing from this panel up here today, I doubt that anybody sat down with uh, business folks like this and listened uh, to what they have to say before this bill was constructed. And I can tell you as a physician, I don't think they sat down with health care professionals either to see uh, whether or not this was feasible. So now we have this problem. You are sitting here wondering how we are going to continue to uh, employ people in this nation. The greatest crisis facing our country right now is unemployment and spending. And everything about this bill that I can see is nothing but driving up costs and government spending. And, and frankly, government spending is nothing more than taxes. The, our government doesn't generate any revenue outside of taxes. So anyway, I wanted to ask a few more questions. Uh, Mr. Brewer, the uh, CBO has uh, estimated that as many as 12 million employees could be forced into the exchanges. Uh, do you find this number accurate? No. I think the uh, CBO is made up of smart, hardworking, well-intentioned people. Uh, I don't know how much interaction they have with people who uh, have employees and payrolls and have to make these decisions, but I can tell you we dealt with about 3,000 of them last year and the year before that and the year before that. So I, I think the incentives that we uncovered in our, our actuarial studies uh, as, long, and, and as well as the information we got as a result of our survey would suggest to me that I, I don't know how many renewals CBO did last year, but as I said, we did about 3,000, and uh, we're coming to a much different conclusion based upon that information. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Putzer, uh, will the health care law lead you to automate more services or replace full-time workers with part-time staff? Absolutely. We will, uh, people who are currently full-time employees, we will have to make part-time employees, which means they will have to have two jobs to get a full-time salary. We will automate positions such as the cashier. Right now they have those ordering kiosks like the ATM or what you see at the gas station where you pay with your credit card. We haven't used those because we like the personal touch and they are a little expensive, but once you implement this health care bill, I think those kiosks are going to become much more desirable. So. Uh, will be reducing labor force and also automating positions. Okay. Well, I am out of time, but just quickly, do you believe most of your workers prefer a job or government health insurance? Uh, absolutely. And I think the fact that only 6 percent of the 17,000 part-time employees we offer insurance to take it would be a very strong indication that that is true. Thank you. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to uh, thank you for calling this hearing. And as I was sitting here listening, I could not help but think about my days as an employer um, of a small law firm, and we provided insurance for our employees. And um, it took away from our profit, but we did it. We did it because we believed that it was the right thing to do. There were only three lawyers, but we had about five clericals, and we did it. Um, and let me also say this. I am not here to chastise anybody about anything, but I take great offense when I hear the word Obamacare. There is no such thing. Members of this Congress voted for this legislation, and um, many of us have very strong feelings about it because we are seeing people in our districts without insurance, we are seeing people literally die. So it is a very serious thing. And so there has to be a balance here, and I appreciate your comments, because I, I can look at this thing from, from a small business employer for 20 years, but I can also look at it from the standpoint of a legislator uh, who have seen the results of uh, people who uh, end up in emergency rooms and we are paying a lot more through emergency room care, uh, and we all end up paying for that. But you said something, Ms.
Braden that I found very intriguing and very interesting. And correct me if I'm wrong. <coughs> You said something to the effect that you saw people that were not, that were not, uh, you said, trying to, not seeing anyone trying to, to be healthy. What, what did you mean by that? Well, and how do you know that? <laughs> because I deal every day with the people in, inside the companies that I work with. That's, mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. Um, if you look at people and healthy, we are not talking health insurance. When you go to the emergency room, you are receiving health care. Mm -hmm. And we sort of have taken those two subjects and melded them together. And really, I think what we need to do is separate them apart. Mm -hmm. If you take health insurance, what it does is support people in health care. Mm -hmm. If people are getting health care, that is one thing. But if they are not taking care of themselves, mm -hmm. then they are driving up the cost of health care, which does drive up the cost of insurance. I guess what I am saying to you is that there are a lot of people who First of all, part of the Affordable Care Act was to, the, one of the driving forces was to keep people well. And another thing that we were trying to do was to try to drive down the costs that these insurance companies were charging for these policies. It is a hard thing to control. Well, in, in insurance, it is really easy. It is premium paid in, claims paid out. So if you want to control health care costs, you have got to control claims paid out. I mean, insurance isn't hard. It is a pass-through. The reason we have insurance was to make deals with doctors and hospitals at a reduced cost so that every individual company didn't have to go do those negotiations. I understand. But did you realize that when we were going through this, there were insurance companies that literally out in California went up on their rates 30 percent, 30 percent? When I looked at some of those policies, because we heard about Blue Cross Blue Shield out there, and I called some of my constituent, my uh, folks out there that I work with, there was one policy that they said 59 percent. Well, that was five people on it, and the policy was rich, very rich, and had been constructed over 20 years ago. Well, that's so one, but I'm just saying pieces, they went. I'm talking about over, over, over. Well, I, I don't want to get caught up in this, but mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say to you is that there's one thing we're trying to. When we talk to uh, health care insurance people, it is not as simple as you are making it sound, in and out. That, that, that sounds nice, and if that was true, that would be, accurate, that would be nice. But part of the Affordable Health Care Act was to try to say to these companies that were spending, say, for example, health, uh, insurance companies spending 35 percent on overhead, 40 percent on overhead, that they had to control that and they had to put more into medicine. Another part of the uh, Health Care Act was to deal, try to address this thing of preexisting conditions. You know, there are people who, and, and God forbid it happened to any of you all, you get cancer, a scare with cancer, and if you have a gap in your insurance right now, you will never get insurance. I have had people in my family in that situation. If they had $100,000 to pay for insurance, they couldn't get it. So I think we have to be careful when we are looking at this because there are parts of the bill that you might like. And there are other parts that you might not like. But I think, again, we, we've got to be careful. Well, again, we're trying to bring down the cost so that we can, so that people will stay well, because we're going to pay one way or, the, or another. I realize I've run out of time, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman from Maryland. Uh, Chair would now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am a health care provider. I'm a dentist, and I am a small businessman. So, um, there's theory and then there's application. So a lot of things look great on paper, and I know every single one of you hear it in your board meetings every day. But then there comes the reality of how does it actually be implicated. And Mr. Gardner, I know you cite and model, and you show that small businesses actually um, benefit from government takeover of health care. I prefer that term because I can tell you and back that up um, that that's what it is. However, the model assumes much smaller growth in health care costs, an assumption both the CBO and CMS have rejected as being highly implausible. And I think we have seen a lot of that discussion and looking back at equations and numbers making that. Instead of relying on an academic model and with faulty assumptions, how many businesses um, are you aware of that are enthusiastic about this health care plan? Many. And um, if we could have some of them call you 
and uh, or write you um, if you'd like. Oh, I'd love to. I, you know, can you pull off a couple off the top of your head? Um, yeah, they, I think some of them were cited in my written testimony, um, and uh, um, I'm just thinking of one uh, right here in the uh, greater metro area, Mike Bray, with the hobby shop. Uh, so there he's uh, come at, uh, on his own and uh, testified. How about, so how about something in Arizona? I, I, I don't like examples in the Beltway. How about something out, out in Arizona? Um, I don't have one off the top of my head in Arizona. I would like to know. Um, Mr. Brewer, do you think that uh, you, you are, are real happy with the assumptions based off what I just asked Mr. Gardner? You mean the CBO assumptions? Mm -hmm. No, not is at it all. Gonna I, is it going to create jobs? No. And the, uh, the, the, everything that we see indicates the incentive to a cattle drive to the exchanges. Oh, I like that. And I am going to skip you for just a second because I am coming back to you, okay? <laughs> Um, Mr. Morey, how about you? I, I do not see the opportunity for job creation out of this bill, no. How about you, Mr. Payne? None. How about you, Mr. Pudzer? It is a job killer. It is not a job creator. So my, my, my colleague on the other side talked about the administrative costs. Mr. Pudzer, tell me where the administrative costs many times are, are linked. Um, is it in less government regulations or more? A less government regulation will drive down administrative costs. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Yes, same thing. Government regulation costs a lot of money. Mr. Morey. I would echo those comments. Yep. How about Mr. you, Mr. Burr? Oh, certainly. I'm not being dis disrespectful because I I got something special for you, <laughs> Mr. Gardner. Less is more. Okay. I, I love that. So so my colleagues on on our side have been talking about, or the opposite side, have been telling us that the Republicans have been never proposing any jobs. And what we are really trying to do is get to the core matter of it. We are not trying to put a Band-Aid on it. We are trying to streamline the red tape. Mr. Brewster, uh, Brewer, you made the comment of a cattle call, okay? Cattle drive. A cattle drive? Cattle call. Hmm. We are going into a— They are different things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I am a Texas boy. <laughs> I am from Wyoming, so you use one to get to the other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and so, Ms. Braden, you made some, some wonderful comments, in, and that is, is there is a responsibility. I am a believer we need reform, but not the reform I saw, okay? because you hit it, and that is, is there is personal accountability, personal responsibility. And I do believe there was a little company in, I in Iowa that actually had a concept like this, if I am not mistaken that what they basically did is they invested in the employee and they said, listen, we are going to make you see your family doctor and that preventative service, whatever they come up with, we are going to give you time during that work day to be able to do that, but you have got to stay on that preventative model. And if I am not mistaken, and, and then they made another caveat, they said that as long as you stay on that caveat, we will pay 100 percent of your claims. They said if you fall off, you are going to pay 25 percent co. You fall off again, it is 50 percent co fall off a third time, it is 75 percent co, and so forth and so on. And guess what? Everybody went to the doctor. Everybody went to the doctor. And guess what? You died with that company. What a job creation that was. Because what happened is you had investment from the, the patient and the employer and the health care benefit all the way across the board, minimizing the red tape. So thank you very much for making sure that we understood that we are not here about job stymieing. We are here about building jobs on reducing red tape. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. The uh, Chair would now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me, too, welcome uh, uh, two of my friends, former colleague and friend, uh, the former Senator Jim Talent from my home state of Missouri. Thank you for being here, as well as uh, my, my friend, Mr. Puster, who owns a who runs a significant operation uh, out in Missouri, thank you for your testimony today. Um, let me let me start out by saying that the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is the law of the land, and it's a good law. And like any law, it could be improved. However. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle are not interested in honestly examining the positive and negative aspects of the law, and I think they are just interested in repealing it and scoring a political victory over President Obama. 
uh, this health care reform law is good for Americans, it's good for businesses, and especially small businesses. It's, and it's very good for young businesses, which are actually the ones that create the most jobs. And I'm so glad to hear the phrase, job creation. First time I've heard it in over six months in this committee. Some have raised concerns that businesses won't be able to afford compliance with the ACA. Uh, Ninety-eight percent of employers will be exempt from the insurance mandate, and 95 percent of the businesses that are not exempt already offer health insurance to their employees. Uh, this misleading premise of this particular hearing is that the ACA hurts so-called job creators. Now, let me start with Mr. Gardner. Um, thanks to the ACA, starting this year, consumers will receive more value for their premium dollar because insurance companies will be required to spend 80 to 85 percent of premium dollars on medical care and health care quality improvement rather than on administrative costs. If they don't, the insurance companies will be required to provide a rebate to their customers starting in 2012. This provision is known as the medical loss ratio. Uh, Mr. Gardner, do you believe that the combination of the medical loss ratio requirements and the shop exchanges will make it easier for employers to offer quality, affordable health insurance to their employees? You know, in terms of the MLR, we have looked at the data. There is a lot of states uh, uh, before, you know, um, the ACA passed, and currently we are under those rates in those states already, and the world didn't come to an end. So we just see it as this means it is feasible for insurance companies in other states to do it, and the 22 million self-employed who buy insurance today in the individual market was certainly going to be protected. And the uh, 4.8 small bu small bu <laughs> million companies that have under 10 employees um, who are paying a lot more for insurance than uh, other businesses that have more than 10 employees are going to benefit from this, too, because they are in the small group market. Uh, and we think the exchanges are really the critical part for making, uh, putting small businesses on a level playing field. They, they don't have the option to really be uh, self-insured if you are 10, 20 employees, 50, where the bulk of small businesses uh, are. Uh, and uh, these exchanges can work, and uh, they have been proven um, to work. And uh, we think that is going to be the driving force for making it more available and more affordable for small business. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, Mr. Puster, um, I have heard your concerns about providing the nutritional information for the products that you sell. Uh, other than that requirement, do you think that this law will help shave uh, cost on health care for your employees? Uh, and when I say shave costs, uh, will it help reduce the cost of prescription medicines? Uh, will it make the, the delivery of health care more efficient for your employees? I, I don't believe that it will. I, as, as I said early on, I am not, I'm not a health care expert. I can tell you how it impacts our company from a financial perspective. Uh, but Right now, you know, I, w I went into our restaurants when, uh, when, all, when the health care debate was going on, and I asked, I, I said to some of the employees, why do so few of you buy these, this insurance that we offer that is so inexpensive? And the response was, well, Mr. Puzder, we get it for free at the emergency room. So I don't know how much better they are going to do than free. <laughs> well, that's, that's why we are trying to connect people with health care providers and that and, and to cut down the cost of people showing up at the emergency room for a cold. I, I, I agree with that. I just I, I think that, they're, that the employee is not going to be positively impacted. But there should be something done to cut those emergency room costs. You got a very good point there. Thank you, and I yield back. 
I thank the gentleman from Missouri. Uh, with the indulgence of our panel and my colleagues on both sides, we would like to have a second round, which we sometimes refer to as a lightning round. My colleagues do not need to feel the need to take their full five minutes if they don't want to. But uh, I will start with the distinguished gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Clay, for shortening the term to uh, HCA or Health Care Act and dropping the affordable. That is a little easier for me to, to pallet. But uh, you, know, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, this bill was brought about and it is the law of the land, and, and you were glad to hear us mention job creation. And I think we are all here today talking about the detriments to job creation. And I think that point has been very strongly made. Um, and in terms of uh, the, the last question on, on shaving cost, uh, I worry more as a physician about shaving quality because we are trying to uh, increase the number of people into a health care market with really no means to pay for it. Um, but you know, that is not entirely true because uh, our friends on the other side of the aisle believe that Obamacare's taxes, which include the employer mandate tax penalty, an increase in the Medicare Part A tax, a new tax on investment income, a new tax on health insurance providers, a new tax on drug manufacturers, and a new tax on medical device manufacturers are, are paid by firms out of their massive profit buckets. Moreover, they believe taxes only impact the top 2 percent of taxpayers. Based on your experience, is this a fair uh, portrait of reality? And I will just open that to whoever would like to grab it. No, it's no, it's not. I, I, I don't. There's no way you add all those taxes in and reduce the cost of health care. Period. Okay. Any, and and I, I'd like to. And Mr. Cummins had mentioned how his firm had been profitable. Congressman Cummins, how his firm had been profitable. They gave those profits into paying for insurance. I think part of what we're all saying here is we can take those profits and put them into insurance. But if we do that, we can't invest them, grow our businesses, and create jobs. So it's that we're, we're not really in conflict on that. But you can't. We, like I said, there is no corporate pot of gold to go to to pay for this stuff. We have got to take it from someplace, and it is going to come from growth and job creation. So, again, as you stated, it is a job killer. A job killer. And uh, does the rest of the panel, for the most part, agree with that? I think um, part of the solution to getting more dollars uh, in the system is that everyone, as has been talked about here, every citizen has to be responsible. And I think that is why there was an individual mandate put in. You can't have a bunch of people who don't pay but yet can show up and get coverage in doing what people are talking about here. So um, I don't think anybody has ever looked at this and said that you could have a sustainable health care system and not have everybody in the system and everybody paying their fair share. Okay, so basically uh, forced health care? I don't think you can have a system with freebies. Okay. It doesn't work. There has always been a big debate about exactly who was uninsured uh, in this country. You know, I heard numbers early on that there was 30 million uninsured. Uh, we have asked people to define who those 30 million were. Uh, apparently up to half may have been here illegally and not eligible for health care. Uh, perhaps half of the remaining 15 million are folks that uh, would qualify for Medicare but just haven't signed up. And then the other half are some of the workers that are young and bulletproof and just opt not to have health insurance. So in essence, this new law of the land that was imposed upon people against their will, and, and clearly the majority of people in this country still do not want this, is uh, what we are stuck with at this point. And I think that is why we are having hearings to show the detriment of this health care law and what it is going to do to impact the economy and yet not really resolve the health care problem. It was uh, you know, poor, uh, poorly conceived. It was passed in the middle of the night, and, and people maybe have forgotten about how that occurred. But uh, let, let's get back on uh, to some more questions. Uh, Mr. Putzker, did Hardee's need a government mandate to add uh, salads to its menu? No, no, we we've actually Carl's Jr. We've had uh, salad since the 1970s. Used to have salad bars. Okay, a government mandate to add turkey burgers? No, no, not at all. They tested well and sold well. Okay, so uh, you you're managed to do things to help people help keep people healthy without government mandates. You we uh, we love it if people buy healthy products. We're happy to sell them. Right, and and so now uh, federal mandates of uh, you know, sign changes to. Uh, help people understand what it is they are buying? Do you think that is going to impact their habits, or do people just kind of do what they 
Well, I, no, I don't think it is, other than, uh, well, there have been a number of studies on this, and I have included them in my written testimony that, uh, that show that, in fact, that has no impact on people's eating habits. In fact, anecdotally, we have noticed in some of the restaurants where there is already menu labeling required, people think that fast food has more calories than it does, and they actually end up ordering higher calorie uh, products once they see what the caloric content actually is. So it is it's been a very interesting experiment so far that clearly hasn't worked. Okay, I, my time is out. I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Tennessee. Would now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, I was thinking when you walk into my home, my wife has a sign that says, "Welcome to the Davis household," and then it says, "Please know that the opinion of the husband." <laughs> is not necessarily that of management. <laughs> and, and I am so pleased <laughs> that opinions <laughs> don't necessarily manage <laughs> what we do all of the time. I am amazed at some of the things that I hear. I, job killer, if you create an opportunity for more than 30 million people in this country to have health insurance and go to the doctor on a regular basis and stay out of the emergency rooms of hospitals and to live longer. The only business that I could see that gets hurt by this is the undertaker. And he doesn't get hurt too much because eventually he's going to get you anyway. I mean, you just, it takes a little bit longer. Could someone please share with me how creating opportunity for 30 million people, over 30 million, to get decent health care that, that, that creates the need over the next 10 or 15 years for 150,000 additional doctors, for more than 250,000 nurses, could someone tell me how that kills jobs? I, I think I can, Congressman. Um, it, there is a, let, let's, let's just assume that there is this benefit, as you have outlaid it. I don't know that it's a health care, if it is a health care benefit or a health insurance benefit, because I think the law requires health insurance. They already get health care. But let's just talk about the health insurance benefit. Benefits have costs. The money to pay for those benefits has to come from somewhere. Our business makes a profit. All of that profit is reinvested in the business. When the profit is reduced, you invest less in the business. If the profit is eliminated, you have nothing to invest in the business. If you don't have anything to invest, you can't grow and you can't create jobs. So there is a benefit, and I am not here to argue about that. I just want you to know that there is a cost associated with the benefit, and I think the businesses that are at this table here are telling you but if in some dead, instances it may put them out of business. If I am dead <laughs> because I couldn't get health care, can I come to your business no, but there will be, be somebody to replace him. Uh, Congressman, your, your uh, passion is evident and commendable, and your conviction is commendable, but, but he's, he's right. The, you know, anything you do that, that erodes profits in an organization impedes their ability to create jobs. Uh, and, and as much uh, 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 right alongside the cost implications of the Affordable Care Act, are, are the administrative complexities that, that it makes it easier for an employer just to throw up their hands and say, heck, I'm out. Uh, uh, let, let's send these folks to the uh, exchanges, and then they can be subsidized by the taxpayers. I'm, I'm, I'm all for everybody having health care. I totally agree with you on that. I think we disagree fundamentally on how you get there. But, see, I think that, that, that the realities are if you even just deal with the question of fairness, if you ask a bird, is it fair for birds to eat worms, and you turn around and ask the worm the same question, chances are you are going to get a different answer. And so if you ask the thousands of employees in my congressional district who provide health care for people all over the world, 
if somehow or another their ability to provide these services will drive down jobs or take away jobs, they would probably disagree vehemently. I am I'm I'm sorry, that is not, that, not what our survey results tell they us. They would disagree. Well, the ask the 21 hospital administrators in my congressional district if they would agree. Um, Congressman Davis, there is another important aspect of, of job creation, and that relates to job block. And job block has two impacts. One, uh, employees at a company who don't want to leave because they go somewhere else, maybe they wouldn't have health coverage and it is very vital for they and their uh, family members. The other is, who is going to start those new companies? And those are people in the workforce working at a job, and they go through this the same system, and, and the harder it is for them to see their way to go out and launch in the first step to be a self-employed person, to found a company, and they can't get benefits for them and their family and they are a responsible person, they are going to stick with their job. So uh, it is more complicated than just surveying existing companies. Um, there is a whole bunch of other factors about who starts businesses and how they grow at the bottom. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I certainly agree in terms of our health care delivery system. We have much more of a sickness care system than we do a health care system. So I would certainly agree with you, Ms. Braden, on, on that point, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. My colleague, Mr. Davis, really brings it forth, forthright. First of all, life isn't fair, never has, never will be. Um, if you are a business, you should never complain about a profit. That is what you should do. That is what it has to happen in order to create jobs and to have the ability to, to employ more. Um, the other thing this, that we have to look at is, is, is um, when government impedes itself or impugns itself into any type of parts of our life to the uh, degradation of that industry, we see it we see it flounder. I'll give you a good example. You don't have to look very far with government intrusion in health care to look at the Native Americans. Boy, there is a great employment rate there, 60 percent at the Navajo Nation, 75 percent in the Apache Reservation, all because of dictations by, the health, by government. And why do I bring that up? Well, because this program is based on a flawed system that flawed it from the very get-go as it demanded that you had to go to the emergency room. You couldn't turn anybody away. You couldn't even ask the questions. Where are you from? How, the, how do you look? You, know, what, you couldn't turn them away. So what we have done is we have restricted care, and medicine did that. I am happy to say I am from, I'm from dentistry. We never went down that road. And the reason I say that is, is that today, for every dollar spent in dentistry, 50 percent comes out of the patient's pocket. So they have risk. They find value. That is why you see lots of dentists. I, of course, we are not doing so go, good right now because we don't have a good economy. Okay? But there is some, something inherently right about that. So um, I kind of want to continue that by saying, um, you know, in 2014, employers will have to employ with at the at least the 50 person full time employees who will face a penalty for failing to provide minimum essential coverage. How is this going to affect businesses specifically in respect to hiring? Mr. Brewer. Well, it's going to people who have 49 employees are going to keep 49. Uh, I think there's a fair uh, number of our survey respondents that suggested that they would go to more part-time employees so they wouldn't have to offer coverage. That, that um, there's there there's no way that helps in in their hiring hiring practice. So what we're doing is we're cost shifting again. We're we're making it go back to the government so that the government's going to have to streamline them just like they did in the Medicare roles where what we do is we look at the equations and we take away certain benefits so that we set them on Medicaid. That right. that's this whole system is based on a flawed system. It doesn't work anywhere along the line for job creation. Ms. Braden. If you really look at what the the cost of health care is to an employer, there's not one employer sitting here that can tell you that it costs less than $3,000, which is the fine per year. Every one of us pays on an individual basis, pays more than $3,000 for our health care for our employees per year. So now we've got a fine that is less than what we're currently paying. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what we're going to do. 
And let me ask you the next thing. You talked about the administrative cost. A lot of that administrative cost, is it not true that it has to do with tort? Yes. Yep. And, and did you see anything in this bill, any one of them, do you see anything about tort reform in this bill? In fact, it was refused. I wonder why. I guess I'm a dentist, not an attorney. <laughs> You know, that's where the American people need to stand up and businesses need to stand up. Um, Mr. Morey, how do you see this is going to affect those, so those people, aren't those businesses that are under 50, 50 jobs? I see, it. Uh, I see it very much the same way. I would like to, to mention that the issue of tort reform, to me, is, is gigantic. Uh, Paramount, right? I would like it to go beyond medical into general tort reform, if possible, from our, for our business perspective as well. But, you know, I mean, ultimately, we want to employ, pe employ people. We want to provide them great coverage. We just don't want, you know, mandates shoved down our throat and how to do it. And ultimately, I think that the free enterprise system does a pretty good job. The marketplace does a pretty good job of uh, attracting the better employers attract better staff members. The marketplace does work. Uh, Mr. Putzer, you really drive my attention because equations, you, you know, when you are in business, you are looking at all the parameters and what COT possibly could do. Have you run all the numbers? Are you comfortable with all the numbers based upon this bill and how it is going to impugn uh, job creation? Uh, no, no, Congressman. In, in fact, we hired uh, an expert in this area, Mercer. They are one of the national experts on health care costs. And while their best estimate is that our health care costs will increase $18 million, which is that 150 percent, the range runs from $7.3 million to $35.1 million. Now, I have to tell you, in any other aspect of my business, if one of the people who works for me came to me with an estimate that ran from $7 to $35 million, I would tell them to go back and sharpen their pencils. But nobody can figure it out. Um, one last question, a little, just a quick indulgence. If you have a program in your business that is failing, what do you do? Terminate it, replace it, try and figure out what the next best thing is. That is exactly what this, this, this law is, and it should be terminated. We should have the guts to say that. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Arizona that would now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. I want to just reference something that the, uh, Dr. Gosar uh, said, and I, just, I, don't want to, I was meeting with staff, and I, so I, I may have missed it. So correct me if I'm wrong, that he was glad that dentists can turn away people, uh, unlike emergency rooms, dental care, uh, people pay 50 percent in the average of, of uh, calls, and they have some skin in the game? Is that accurate? I will yield to the gentleman. Did I say that? I'm just asking you, what did you say about it is okay to it, you, you're Okay, well, I just, I just wanted to uh, just say that um, I spend a phenomenal amount of my time working on a case called the Diamante Driver case. This was, this was a 12-year-old boy who had a tooth infection. He was on Medicaid, and he couldn't find a dentist because he was, he was being turned away, 12-year-old. And this was three years ago. And so because a dentist would not accept him, and this was in Maryland, my state, he, the infection from a $80 tooth decay problem, it would cost $80 to treat it, he died, 12 years old, because a dentist turned him away. And they spent $250,000 trying to save his life at the end. And so, you know, I guess with regard to dental care and care, period, I just say that, our, you know, our country is, is, is better than that. We are better than that. And I understand, believe me, to all of you, I understand what you are saying. I understand business, it is hard being in business. For you all who have your own businesses, a lot of people don't realize what you go through. They don't realize all the folk you got to deal with, the IRS, you got to deal with making sure the lights are on, you got to make sure uh, if you got grass, you got to get, make sure the grass is cut, everything. You got to pay for every toothpick, every pen, every pencil. You got to make sure employees are okay. You got to deal with absenteeism. You got to deal with all kinds of stuff. But at the same time, I think that you know, we have to also balance that 
when, well, if we're talking about our people, people, are, of course, will make our, our businesses go. And if they are not healthy, that's a problem. That's a real big problem. And no, there are those that may not see it as health care and um, as a right. Uh, I, I still happen to think so. But I do believe that when we get to a point where we feel that it's okay to, if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a skilled lawyer and I, somebody comes in to me and they've got a, a problem, uh, but it's not, that's a little different because I'm talking about life and death. That's different. But if I have a skill, and, and like the doctors in my state, not in Arizona, but in my state, who turned this little boy away, and I'm talking about a whole lot of them tur that turned him away, and you die at 12, I don't know how many of you all have children, but you get a kid that dies at 12, you don't forget it. And so what we've done is we've spent a lot of time, I've spent a phenomenal amount of my time trying to make sure that that never happens to another child in our state again. As a matter of fact, because of uh, Diamante Driver, uh, we have now been able to uh, take Maryland from one of the uh, worst states uh, with regard to having dentists who work with kids on Medicaid to one of the top, I think it's either number one or number two, in a matter of two or three years. And so the reason why I mention that is because my staff had mentioned to me, uh, like I said, I was with a staff member, and that statement was made, and maybe I misunderstood or misquoted. I'm sorry I didn't hear it. But I just want to make it clear that there's something that it, I think was, should always be above profit, and that is life, healthy health, and safety. And, um, and I just I think it's a very, um, I, think it's, I think that's what the Affordable Care Act was about and is about. And as somebody said a little bit earlier, no, it's not perfect. But a lot of its imperfections were because of people trying to satisfy both sides of the aisle to get a decent bill. And, and it did not come out perfect. It is not a product. It is a project. That means it can ever get better. So with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from, uh, from Maryland. Uh, my father is a physician. Um, the only two things that kept me from following his footsteps were math and science. Uh, if it weren't for those two, um, I, I might have become one as well. And I was sitting here while Mr. Cummings was talking, who is one of the most eloquent members of Congress and somebody that I have uh, a lot of personal affection for. Uh, I, I remember always being the last ones to leave church because folks wanted to ask my dad questions. I remember holidays being interrupted. But the thing I remember the very most are the people who would call at night and say, my kid's been sick all day. Can you come see him tonight? That's frustrating. When somebody's been sick all day, why you didn't take advantage of the office hours? Why you waited until the evenings? And my mom would say, why don't you charge more? And he never would do it. So my question to you all is, what is the role of personal responsibility in our health care system? Do we incentivize the right conduct? And we've got all these different models from what we have now to what's perceived as radical, which is decoupling health insurance from employment. It's perceived as radical, but that's the way we existed up until 1944. We didn't get our health insurance from our employer. It, we got it ourselves. I'm not smart enough to know the difference between a right and a privilege. I just know this. Personal responsibility has to be part of the equation, or we're not going to make it as a republic. So I would ask you this in conclusion, and I'll just I'll let you go from left to right, give you all the last word, although we've only got about three minutes, so apportion it accordingly. What is the role of personal responsibility, and how can our country better incentivize the right conduct and penalize the wrong conduct in our health care system? When you said right to left, does that mean you're starting with me? <laughs> I know, is your right or my right? Your right to left, my left to right. I always like to start on the right. <laughs> okay, I guess it's me. <laughs> um, yeah, the, um, I, I think private enterprise and state governments are the best place to make determinations as to health care. I think there are many things that the Federal Government could do that would contribute to a better health care system. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if health care is a right or not, Congressman, but I know it's the law. 
I know a re a, an emergency room cannot turn you away. What we are talking about here is health insurance, not health care. Health care they get, people get now. This is why they don't take up our offer on health insurance when we offer to pay even 60 percent. They are getting health care. This is about health insurance and how you allocate those costs. The way they are allocated now, they will destroy our ability to create jobs and prosper. That doesn't mean that profits, profits will go down, but profits are what we reinvest to grow. And if we can't reinvest to grow, we can't create jobs and we can't create prosperity, which is what American business has done for over 200 years. I, I agree with that completely. Uh, I think there is some personal responsibility that has to go into the, uh, into the medical uh, uh, cost. I agree with the, the Skin in the Game program uh, years ago and programs that I was in. You had to pay, you had to pay for the, the coverage, turn it in and get reimbursed. Well, I understand people may not have money to pay to start with. In our districts, every plant that I've got, I've gone around and checked, our people get medical coverage. It's there. Our property taxes, everything is paying for it already. I haven't had a single complaint of a person in our organization that comes back to us and says that, says that hey, we have got an employer or somebody in their family that has got a serious problem. Uh, we just we don't have that, that problem at all. The throw, uh, it's not a, a question of whether people have the right to have the insurance or the coverage. Everybody wants that for them. There is no question. It is where does the cost lie. In our company, it is throwing all the costs to the employer to pay these new expenses. <clears throat> and where does that cash come from? It is it's a big burden on companies in the middle, uh, on all companies, I suspect, but certainly on our company. It is a burden that uh, that is bigger than we have. It is a problem. I have got about 45 seconds left to split between four of you. So, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Um, I, we provide $100 incentive for folks to go get a physical um, on top of uh, it is already covered in the program. We provide a smoking cessation program that is for both the staff member and for their, and for their spouse. Um, these are the kind of things we do to try to help people help themselves. That is where I think much of that responsibility lies, and that is on the individual person. When I, when I look at it, it can go so much farther, and we all have a story, and I respect that because I have got them in, just in my practice alone with people that were offered health care and health insurance and didn't take it. That is a private decision. What exactly is our responsibility, and does the government regulate it? I am not sure. I think if these guys really looked at their businesses, they would say that the reason they offer the wellness that they do is because they know it improves their workforce and they get more out of it. If we really wanted to look at health care, we would start with dentistry, and we would say if you don't have your teeth cleaned twice a year, you are not entitled to, to basic and major dental, because everything starts in the mouth. So, I mean, we are looking at health care, and we are looking at wellness, and we are looking at health insurance, three different things. Mr. Brewer. Uh, one of the things that ACA did get right was increasing the opportunity for employers to incent people to well behavior. Uh, we have got a pretty sophisticated practice in our firm of helping clients design programs that incent people uh, to live healthier lifestyles and make better lifestyle decisions. So, uh, and this morass of things that we don't like in ACA, uh, certainly that aspect of it was welcome. Um, I think there's three things I mentioned. One is I think you have to have an individual mandate, um, so everybody pays their fair share um, and, and gets coverage. Uh, I think employees need to know the cost, the total cost of insurance, uh, including what employers are paying. Most of the time they don't realize how much it really costs. Uh, and we have uh, seen in all our surveys and meetings with uh, small businesses where 42 percent of Americans work, that uh, small businesses would uh, like wellness and prevention programs that fit small business. Uh, and they don't um, have access. We hope that exchanges run by states can do this um, there. And I agree that dentistry has some good models. Um, I know I don't have to pay any copay if I get in there, and I think that is a good incentive and has been proven to work. Well, on behalf of the Chairman, I would like to thank you very much for your indulgence for two rounds, and thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Your meeting is adjourned.